All right. Let's start in Revelation chapter 12, please. Revelation chapter 12. Have lots of scripture I want to look at with you this morning. In ancient Greek mythology, the lure of the siren was a most powerful attraction. The siren's song calling out to maritime sailors as they were passing by. Homer writes in the Odyssey of the tales of Odysseus, and Odysseus had been warned about the sirens. That their beautiful songs would lure sailors in, only later to leave corpses behind. But these sirens, Odysseus was intrigued by them. And yet he had been warned about the fate of those who pursued the siren's song. And so as Odysseus and his crew were sailing by, he, he had his crew stuff their ears with wax so they wouldn't be able to hear the sound of the sirens. But curious to a fault, Odysseus did not put wax in his ears. He wanted to hear what the sirens sounded like. He wanted them to sing and, and to reveal their secrets. But he had his crew tie him with ropes to the mast of the ship so that as they sailed by, he would be able to hear, but he could not jump into the ocean and swim to his death. The legend of the siren's song is something that we still talk about, even proverbially to this day. We, we talk about the lure of the siren's song, and when we use that expression, we're talking about something that has the appearance of something that's good, something that we should want, something that we should pursue, and yet if we pursue it, it won't end well. The word that we use for that is deception. A deceiver is someone who promises one thing, but then gives us something else. Satan is called the great deceiver. In Revelation chapter 12 and in verse 9, it says that the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He is the deceiver of the entire world. And what he uses, his siren song to lure us in, is temptation. He places temptations before us. He, he flashes sin in front of us and it calls out to us. That temptation is something that looks like something we should pursue. Something within us wants to go after that because we feel like there is a promise of some form of good. In Hebrews chapter 3, our scripture reading this morning, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, the writer says that he wants none of us, to become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceiving. And we can become hardened in our conscience and hardened in our spirits because of temptation and sin. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, let's begin at verse 1. The Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. I want you to look at the language that Paul uses in verse 1. That there are, will be people who will fall away from the faith. Why have they done that? Because they have paid attention. They have focused. 
they have given careful thought and consideration. They have paid attention to deceitful spirits. To spirits that lie to them, that mislead them. They've watched them, they've listened, they've paid attention to those spirits. And then he says in verse 2 that by means of the hypocrisy of liars, they are seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. That branding iron, hot as it is, when it is pressed onto the hide of a cow, it, it burns, it makes an impression, and, and that hide will will become calloused and scarred in that place. And the writer says, our conscience can harden. Our conscience can, can be branded, as it were, and it can harden because of sin and the deceitful spirits that promote it. So I want us to think about that this morning. What the Hebrew writer called the deceitfulness of sin... How is it that sin deceives us? How is it that temptation and sin can harden us and make us deceived? I want to begin with this general observation, and that is that sin is deceptive because it offers to us what it cannot give. Sometimes people offer things to us that they could give, but they simply choose not to. It's within their ability, it's within their power to give it, but they choose not to. They don't will to give it. That's not the way it is with the devil and with sin. It offers to us that which it cannot give. It is not that it can, but it simply chooses not to. The devil offers us things that he is completely unable to give. And I want to show you four examples of that this morning. Sin will offer liberty, but it only brings slavery. Sin offers, it seems, freedom. Freedom from restraint. Freedom from Suppression. We could have the freedom and the liberty to do whatever it is that we want to do without any consequences. That's what Satan offers. Liberty. But he can't give liberty. He can't give freedom because he doesn't possess it. It's not his to give. He promises us this freedom and he gives us opportunity to exercise this supposed freedom. But when we do... It ends up with negative consequences. I'm going to Genesis chapter 3. This is as old as the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3. The Lord had been very gracious in his provision for Adam and Eve in the garden. All of these trees which I have made. How many trees and plants must there have been in the Garden of Eden? I mean, just stop and think about that for a moment. At, at their disposal, they had every tree that yielded fruit and seeds and everything that they could ever want. It was all right there. And God said to them, all of it is yours except one tree. There is one tree you cannot eat from. Everything else is yours. In chapter 3 and in verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that God said when you eat that fruit, you will surely die. I'm telling you, you will surely not die. That's not the truth. That's not what's going to happen. And in verse 5, he says, God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you hear what the devil is saying to Eve here? Listen, sweetheart. God's holding out on you. He's holding you back from something that would be good for you. 
If you ate this fruit, God knows how much better off you would be, and He doesn't want you to do that. God's cheating you. So go ahead. Go ahead and eat this. It's okay. And so as Eve listens to the deceiving spirit that she is paying attention to, to go back to Paul's language in 1 Timothy 4, she sees this restriction that God has placed upon her. She sees an opportunity to be like God. She was deceived and she took that fruit and she ate it and she gave it to Adam right there with her and he did it too. Do we sympathize with Eve sometimes? You know, I'd really love to go do such and such, and, and I know God tells me not to do that, but it sure looks like fun. I sure wish I could go and do that. I want to participate in this. Yeah, I know God says not to. I know the Bible says it's wrong, but surely there's something else out there that I'm not able to participate in. There's something that I am missing. Young people today call it FOMO. Fear of missing out. Young folks, listen to me. FOMO has led to a lot of stupid decisions. Now, there are some things in life that I don't want you to miss out on. Good things, quality things of life that God wants you to participate in. But I think sometimes we feel like God's laws are restrictive, that God is preventing us from truly enjoying happiness and joy in life. We, we see all the things that God says, don't do this and don't do that and make sure you never do this. And we say, oh, it just, it just seems so restrictive. I just wish I had the freedom to go and do the things that I want to do. Why is it that God is preventing me from doing this thing? When in reality, what we need to recognize is that it's not about prevention, it's about protection. God was preventing Eve from eating the fruit on that tree because he was trying to protect her from its consequences. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, there's an expression here that I think we need to remember. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and in verse 24. Deuteronomy 6, verse 24, Moses says, The Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always and for our survival. Why does, God, why does God give us the laws that he gives us? It's for our good. And look at the next word that he uses. It's for our good always. When God gives us laws, when God tells us, do this, don't do that, we need to understand that he's looking out for us. He's not trying to limit us. He's not trying to, uh, to put, uh, put restraints upon us to make us miserable. He's trying to spare us from unknown depths of harm and pain. In John chapter 8 and verse 34... John chapter 8, verse 34. What is it that sin brings into our lives? Jesus tells us, Truly I say to you, John 8, verse 34, Everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Sin brings slavery. Well, but wait, I, I, I thought that that Satan was offering me freedom. I thought he was offering me liberty. No, he's offering slavery, Jesus tells us. In Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans chapter 6. Verse 16. Romans 6, verse 16. Paul says, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? You are a slave to either sin which leads to death 
or you are a slave to righteousness which gives life. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You are not free in sin, which is what Satan wants us to believe. Jesus Christ came to free us from sin. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. There's some language here that I think is very graphic and very helpful. Proverbs 5, verse 22, beginning. His own iniquities will capture the wicked. And he will be held in the cords of his sin. He will die for lack of instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says in verse 22 that a man's iniquities entrap him. He becomes entangled in the ropes of his own sin. I love that image. The ropes entangle us and the knots are tied and the ropes are tightened around us as we engage in sin we become slaves to sin and those ropes entangle us and we are in bondage to sin the writer of hebrews in hebrews 12 and verse 1 said that we are to run our race, that we are to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us. It's the exact same idea as Proverbs 5.22. As sin progresses in our lives, the tangled web, the knots get tighter and tighter until it chokes out our hope, it chokes out our faith, it chokes out our determination. And as those binds, those cords, those ropes get tighter... The hold which sin has upon us brings us to a place that we cannot come out of without great struggle. The Bible says that sin offers pleasure but brings pain. I'm going to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, talking about Moses, it says in verse 24, that by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of of sin, the passing pleasures of sin. I don't think I'm telling you anything that will surprise you when I say that sin is fun. Sin brings pleasure. That's not an endorsement, by the way. Okay, just in case any of you our young ones are listening. Hey, the preacher said sin was fun. Yeah, that, no, that's not an endorsement. But it's an acknowledgement of the reality. Even the Bible says that sin brings pleasure. Moses could have enjoyed the pleasures of a sinful lifestyle that he grew up in, that he was surrounded in, in the land of Egypt. He could have stayed and enjoyed those pleasures of sinful idolatry and all of the things that were available to him as an Egyptian. But he chose not to do that because Moses recognized something that Hebrews 11.25 says. He chose to suffer ill treatment with the people of God rather to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. The pleasure of sin is momentary. It is not long-lasting. It is something that is fleeting and it is fleeting very quickly. 
So that alcohol that's in your system on Friday night when you're with your friends, it might give you a fun, pleasurable evening, but it could also bring severe and devastating consequences to your life and to the lives of others. The pornography on your computer can bring you a momentary sexual high, but the guilt and the addiction are long-lasting. The affair with that other person, it seems so exciting and fun until it's discovered. And then your life comes crashing down around you. The pleasure is fleeting. The consequences are not necessarily so. But this is what sin does. Sin prevents us from being able to see the end from the beginning. When the lure of the siren song is calling out to us and it appeals to us and our desires and our lusts are being played upon, we can't see the end of the path. We can only see the here and now. We have to be able to see to the end of the road before we choose the path that we walk down. If we could only think about the consequences of our sins before we engage in them, it would help us so much in avoiding sin if we had the wherewithal and the discipline to look to the end of the road. I'm going to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs 7. In Proverbs 7, we have a young man who in this passage is called a fool. And it becomes obvious as you read Proverbs 7 why he is called such. Look with me in verse 6. Proverbs 7, verse 6. For at the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice, and I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man who was lacking sense. There was a young man who was a fool. Now, why is he a fool? Verse 8. Passing through the street near her corner, and he takes the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. And behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning in her heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. In other words, this woman is a troublemaker. She is now in the streets, verse 12, now in the squares, and she lurks by every corner. So she seizes him and kisses him. And with brazen face, she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings, and today I've paid my vows. Therefore, I've come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. She says later on in verse 19, my husband's not at home. He's gone out on a trip, on a long journey. He won't be back for a long time. Why don't you come and let's enjoy company together? And this young man, fool as he is, he is enticed by her seductions. Verse 21 with her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool. This young man, enticed, tempted by this woman, persuasive and cunning as she is, this man ought to have seen the end from the beginning. If you go to the beginning of chapter 7 and look at verse 1, I want you to see what Solomon says here. My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live and my teaching as the apple of your eye. Focus on my teaching, son. What do you have here in Proverbs 7? You have a father who's warning his son 
about the real world. You have a parent concerned about the well-being of his child saying, son, out there is danger. Out there in the world are people who will do this. And when it happens, you need to be prepared. You need to watch out for this. And this boy, as he sees this story with this woman unfold, he needed to have the wherewithal to see the end from the beginning. Verse 23. As he is going with this woman to commit adultery with her, it says, until an arrow pierces through his liver as a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost him his life. Why not? Why didn't he know? He had a teenager asleep in the back. That's why I had to pound on them. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Parents don't. Was it my kid? Somebody will ask me later. Why didn't he know? His father warned him. He had been told this is what's going to happen. Look to the end of the road. See the consequences before you take the first step. Go back to Proverbs 4. What this young man needed was the wisdom of Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet and all of your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your feet from evil. Look down the road. What is at the end of this path if I take it? And so while sin offers pleasure, if there is pain at the end of the path, take another path. I want to offer you something very quickly that might be helpful to you along this regard. Maybe there's some temptation, some sin in your life that you deal with on an ongoing basis. Your heart is convicted about it. You don't want it in your life. You're trying to get it out of your life. Here's something that may help you look down the path to see the end of the road. I want you to take a pen and paper. No, not right now. Take a pen and paper, and I want you to write down a list of every potential negative consequence that could come into your life if you don't get this sin out. Apply your thoughts to that exercise diligently and you will come up with a long list of negative consequences. What will this do to you personally? What will this do to your spouse? What will this do to your children, your reputation in the community, your standing in this church, your job? Make a long list. If this sin in my life is not dealt with and is not removed and it becomes discovered or it becomes something that is unmanageable, what are the consequences? Make your list. And then keep that list in the front of your mind. And when that temptation comes along, you remember that list. You think about your spouse. You think about your kids. You think about your job. You think about this church. Think about what you do to the Lord who died for you. And you remember that list. I've got two more points. These will be substantially faster, shorter points than the first two. Sin offers rationalizations, but then brings reality. Satan has many rationalizations. You know people who've done this. They've justified their sin. Maybe I've done this. Maybe you've done this. Well, yeah, I did that and it was wrong, but... And here comes the excuse. Here comes the justification. Oftentimes we rationalize through comparison. 
well, you know, what you're doing isn't nearly as bad as what that other guy is doing. And so we salve our consciences by comparing ourselves to someone else's sins. Or maybe it's not even a comparison with someone else. Maybe it's still a comparison with what I used to be. Well, yeah, you've got this sin in your life now, but what you're doing now is not nearly as bad as what you used to do. Satan wants us to find that line, the line of sin. You know what I'm talking about, that hypothetical, imaginary line. Well, at what point do I cross the line into sin? Let me get as close to that line as I possibly can without going over. Sometimes we rationalize via popularity. This is the old everybody's doing it argument that we all tried on our parents when we were kids and they all had the same response. But if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you jump off the bridge too? We've all heard that, we've all said that, and it's a good line. It's exactly right. No, I probably wouldn't jump off a bridge if all of my friends were doing it. The rationalization through popularity. Or how about this? The justification because of the rarity of occurrence. You never do anything like this. Just this one time, it's not going to hurt you. Go ahead. You deserve it there was ever a motto for a shopping mall, right? This is it. You never treat yourself to such things. Go ahead. You've earned it. Shopping malls. We all know we bought it on Amazon. Nobody's doing shopping malls anymore, but I think you understand the point that I'm trying to make. This is what Satan does. He tells us, it's okay. This isn't a habit or anything. Go ahead, just this once. But you know, nothing ever becomes a habit if it doesn't first happen once. In order to become an alcoholic, you have to take a first drink. In order to become a drug user, you have to take drugs for the first time. Anything that becomes a habit must first be done once. But this is what Satan does. He tells us to rationalize, to excuse and justify, but he never discloses the reality. And finally, sin offers life. Life to the fullest. Life in the best way you can live it. But in the end, it brings death. I think sometimes we as Christians look with envy on the world around us. They're out there having all the fun. They're the ones going out drinking with their buddies and laughing and carousing and having a big time. I wish I could go and have fun like that. They're the ones who are out fornicating with reckless abandon, not giving any thought to the consequences of what might happen. I wish I could do something like that. I wish I could live the way that people of the world live. This is Satan saying to us, you only live once. Go for it. This is the best way to maximize your pleasure. This is the best way to enjoy life. If you really want to live, go do what everybody else is doing so you can live to the fullest. And it's a lie. It's a lie. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the Holy Spirit says, The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin, wages, what you earn, what you deserve, the wages of sin, death. Galatians chapter 6, 
Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. The world tells us to sow to the flesh. Whatever our appetites, whatever our indulgences, whatever our lusts, fulfill it. Pursue it. That's the way to truly live. But the wages of sin is death. And it doesn't matter how much laughter we have while we engage in it. It doesn't matter how many silly, foolish things that we do that cause us to to laugh with our friends. The wages of sin is still death. And, And I may go out and I may get yet another notch under my belt, but the wages of sin is still death. Young people today talk about their body count. How many people they've gone to bed with? It doesn't matter. Because the wages of sin is death. No matter what the count is. Beloved, we dare not look with envy on the world around us. Don't do that. Don't look with envy on the world. Look upon the world around us with pity. Look on them with pity because they are not aware of the deceitfulness of sin. They don't know what we as Christians know. That God's ways are best. That God's ways give us the very best, most fulfilling life possible. I tried to research who said this first, and I couldn't find the answer. I came up with a number of different things, but I want to share this with you because I think this is helpful. Sin will take you farther than you wanted to go. It will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And it will cost you more than you wanted to pay. I don't know who first said that. It's attributed to many people. But whoever said it was exactly right. The deceitfulness of sin is real. And God wants us to know about it. He wants us to be warned so that we can be prepared. There may be someone here this morning who knows that you have been deceived in your own life. That there is sin in your life and you want the forgiveness of God. You want to get that out of your life. So that you can follow God's ways and have truly the best, most fulfilling life possible. If we can help you this morning, if you're ready to become a Christian or if you're ready to return to the Lord again, we invite you. Please come as we stand and sing together.